Today marks President Joe Biden's 100th day in office, and he's spending it on the road, pushing his plans in person for massive new federal programs. His first stop in Georgia, with a visit to former President Jimmy Carter and a drive-in car rally, then on to Pennsylvania and Virginia in the days ahead, highlighting pieces of his sweeping proposals laid out in his first address to a joint session of Congress, a historic moment where, for the first time in U.S. history, two women stood behind the president on the dais. In his speech, Biden declared America is, quote, rising anew as he called for an extension of social safety net programs and government spending that evoked FDR's New Deal, urging Congress to pass a pair of infrastructure proposals, each with a price tag worth trillions of dollars. To help pull the economy past the pandemic, he proposes investing heavily in children, families, education, internet access, and the nation's roads, striking an optimistic and personal tone, emphasizing the role of government as a force of good. We have to prove democracy still works, that our government still works, and we can deliver for our people. In our first 100 days together, we've acted to restore people's faith in democracy to deliver. We're vaccinating the nation. We're creating hundreds of thousands of new jobs. We're delivering real results to people. They can see it, feel it in their own lives opening doors of opportunity, guaranteeing some more fairness and justice. That's the essence of America. Visually, the speech felt different than most other presidential addresses. Biden spoke to a largely empty chamber, a sign of these pandemic times, with just 200 people in attendance, masked and six feet apart. Joining me now is Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill, who took in the address from her home in the 11th District. Congresswoman Cheryl, of course, you were watching this speech from home, um, as a lot of members did last night. What did you think of it? Broad proposals being talked about here. Well, it was really great. The first thing that struck me, and I, I don't think I was prepared for how much it would move me, really, was that image of two women standing on the dais to see the Speaker of the House of Representatives and the Vice President of the United States of America, both women. Um, as the President himself said, maybe a little too late, but better late than never. It was just wonderful to see that. That kind of set the tone that, that this was different, this was new. Um, and yet I, I really thought the tone and tenor of the President uh, was so so good, just so, so somebody that was there to say, this is how I'm working for you. This is my plan, I'm gonna execute it. This is why, this is, you know, this is how deeply I care about the country. Here's, here's how we're gonna build back better. I thought it was a very good speech. Well, I wanna ask you about that. It, he did include some deeply personal effects, images of folks who were in line to get boxes of food you and I talked about. Um, throughout the last year. Um, two massive infrastructure proposals, though, trillions of dollars each. What would they mean for New Jersey? And is now the time to be raising taxes to be spending like that? So I think some of these proposals are critical to New Jersey. Um, when we look at the Gateway Tunnel Project, which quite frankly, we should already have shovels in the ground. Um, I was just reminiscing with a friend of mine yesterday about a somewhat heated conversation I've had with Secretary Chow in the last administration. So getting the Gateway Tunnel Project funded, um, making sure that we're handling lead pipes uh, in the in the ground, which we've we've had some aging water infrastructure we have to deal with. New Jersey is an old state. We uh, we have been on the forefront of building America for you know hundreds of years, and so we do have to address some of our aging infrastructure. We're relying across the country on Eisenhower era investments, and we've got to address that now. So it's critically important. I think we also are looking at. Um, what are the best investments we can make in our children and our families? Because that's another area we haven't addressed in decades. Should we be doing universal pre-K? The answer, if you look at any of the studies is yes, every dollar we put into universal pre-K um, gets us better outcomes for those children throughout their lives. Um, I have to tell you investments in our community colleges is so smart. I, I was just at the County College of Morris a couple of weeks ago, and the work they're doing 
reaching out to the business community, making sure that they're providing the workforce of tomorrow. They have one program they're doing now and um, they said, we're, we're getting really good responses, really good rates of employment. I said, well, what do you mean by really good rates? They said 100%. They said every single person, he turns to his friend, he goes, that's right, right? And she said, yeah, every single person has been employed from this program. Um, so that's where we should be investing for our future. Are you concerned at all about those increases um, being sustainable? I mean, the president specifically is talking about the top 1% of earners, that this is a time that our recover, our economy is you know, going through a recovery. Well, I have long said, I am not for raising taxes on New Jersey families. We, we already more than pay our fair share. And that's why I've been advocating so strongly um, to get rid of the state and local tax deduction cap. We really have to address that unfair tax cap that, that is really punishing states like New Jersey, the economic drivers, the economic engines of the rest of the country. Are that we're being punished with double taxation for investing in things like the best public school system in this country. How is that negotiating going though? Because we've been following it. We've been checking in with your colleagues who have said that it's, um, you know, really it depends on their vote with some of these infrastructure items. I think I, I will tell you if the SALT caucus, which I'm the vice chair of is any indication, it's going very, very well. Um, that's a, a caucus of over 20 bipartisan members. So it's not just Democrats from New Jersey, it's Republicans uh, from New Jersey and New York and California, all these states that are some of the most innovative places in our country, states that have really put emphasis on education, um, on our schools, on making sure our kids can, can really provide the, the future for this country. We need to make sure that we continue to provide those services. And, and with this downward pressure, you really will see a race to the bottom. Um, this is, you know, I hear people from uh, Oklahoma and Texas saying, well, if you ran your state better, you wouldn't need the state and local tax deduction cap. And I look at them and I say, well, if you ran your state better, you wouldn't need New Jersey tax dollars to always address your issues. That's what we see is we're paying for the rest of the country. Um, and I also say there's not one public school child in New Jersey that I think would trade their public school experience with a child in Oklahoma right now. So we need to address these systemic problems. And one of the big issues is the state and local tax deduction cap. The response from Republicans last night was largely, um, you know, hey, we're on board for some of these, uh, but this is swinging a little too far to the left. You know, we've heard it called a, a liberal wish list. I think you and I spoke about that. Um, is this a moderate enough plan or did the president go a little too far to the left to be able to get that bipartisanship? You know, I think the plan is, is a moderate enough plan to gain a lot of bipartisan support. I think where the negotiations will come um, and where I hear my Republican colleagues expressing concerns is the cost of it. And that's where we're gonna have some negotiations because I'll tell you, some of the Republican pay fors are simply pay fors that I am not willing to accept. So when I looked at the GOP plan, they didn't get rid of the state and local tax deduction cap. They took away money from the, uh, the funds that would pay for the Gateway Tunnel Project. Um, they wanted to claw back some of the state and local funding to pay for the infrastructure investment. These are the things that are so critical to New Jersey. So I'm willing to negotiate and look at the bipartisan plans because I think there's a lot of agreement there, but we do have to be thoughtful about where we're making cuts because again, I wanna make sure that New Jersey comes out on top. I just wanna switch gears quickly to immigration, the issue at the border. Um, what can you tell us about how talks are going in Congress? Some of these items like paths to citizenship and, and where do we stand? Um, how far of a, a way do you feel you all are on some type of agreement? You know, I'm concerned about it. The frustration to me is I think there's broadly speaking a path forward on um, immigration reform, comprehensive immigration reform. We, you know, we know uh, we have the technology to secure our borders. And as a sovereign nation, we need to know what's coming in. We need to be able to address things like um, international criminal syndicates that use our porous border for trafficking and drug trafficking, human trafficking. Um, we need to control our borders, but we also need to make sure that um, we have a, a thoughtful immigration system, that we're addressing the root causes of immigration. Why do we have 
refugees coming to our border. I can't imagine as a mother sending my young child on a dangerous, arduous journey um, to our border. They don't, you know, nobody thinks that's a that's where they want to be. So why, what is pressuring them? And we just had some briefs from um, some of the, uh, the Admiral General in charge of um, the Western Hemisphere talking about these international criminal syndicates and the investments that we have to make as a country to stem the flow of um, refugees. We also have to, we are, we are a country that I think needs to take our asylum responsibilities seriously. I've talked to so many of my community members, many of our asylum, asylum laws were built in the wake of World War II when we turned away too many Jewish refugees. We have to be thoughtful about how we're reforming our immigration system and who we are as a nation when we address these problems. Lastly, I know you've been holding town halls, virtual town halls um, with constituents, what are you hearing um, about the recovery here at home and, and economically and those, you know, still on the hunt for their unemployment benefits or for jobs at this point? So I can tell you over um, COVID, the caseload work of my office went up by over 500 percent um, because in, in large part because of these programs, we were trying to get help to people and because of the the real economic and uh, personal distress of people suffering under the pandemic. So um, that work, we, we still have some tough cases that we're working through. We're continuing to pressure um, the SBA and, and government to make sure that people are taken care of. But, but certainly a lot of the people have received the help they need. When I go out into the community and do small business walks, many people have taken advantage of the PPP loans. The Restaurants Act in the ARP has been very helpful. Uh, many of the mayors have expressed to me their relief. You know, so many of our mayors built their budgets pre-pandemic and were not prepared for the extra vaccine requirements and safety protocols and first responder requirements and teacher and education requirements and building and infrastructure requirements needed to address the pandemic. And so they were coming up on a time when they were gonna have to furlough government workers uh, you know, as we talked about the food lines, I was just at a food distribution site in Essex this morning, and it was over a mile long. Um, the cars lined up for food distribution, and the workers there were from Essex County. So this is not a time to be furloughing many of our workers who are providing help and support to our communities. Um, and if not that, um, they were also, the mayors were looking at possibly having to raise taxes, which nobody wants to do on a struggling, um, a, you know, where people are struggling. So this ARP, I think, has come at the time when people needed it most. And I can sense a, a sigh of relief, especially from many of our mayors who are, are trying to help um, our economy get back on its feet here in New Jersey. Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill, thank you so much for your time today. Good to talk to you. Likewise, and thanks so much for having me.